What if I told you that the world in which we live in is something that has been constructed for us, not something that has been constructed by us? That you and I, we are recipients of ideas. We are reproducers of ideas. We don't produce them. There are ways of seeing, of understanding, of perceiving, and as a consequence of acting within the world are all determined for us, not by us. Take, for example, our idea of success. Success, after all, is the purpose of our lives. But today, success is determined almost entirely in economic terms. Whole countries are measured by financial metrics. And the general thesis is that the more wealth we have, the happier we will be. And as a consequence, the less conflict there will be on Earth. But as numerous case studies have shown us, this is utterly false. And the funny thing is, we know this. The idea that wealth doesn't equal happiness is crystal clear in our minds. And we keep telling it to ourselves all the time. But still today, the economy doesn't work for humanity. Instead, humanity works for economic power. So what if I told you <coughs> that the biggest ideas of our existence have been sabotaged by institutions and that these institutions are creating for us a version of reality that is distinctly biased in favor of those that control them. They can be religious, political, social, economic, for every single big idea in existence out there and by extension inside us, there is an institution trying to control it. There are institutions today telling us what a government should look like, what the edicts of a given religion should be, what romantic love should look like, what beauty should look like, which causes are valid, which ones aren't, which wars are just, which ones aren't, who is a terrorist and who is a freedom fighter. What does patriotism look like? Even the debates we have among ourselves are constructions of these self-same institutions. You and I are simply choosing between alternatives. We are not constructing our own. Freedom of thought has become an illusion. In the true spirit of globalized capitalism, we have outsourced even our capacity for critical thinking. Human beings today are told what to do and what to be in order to be happy, and it's making the world a horrible place to live in. We are slaves to materialism, we are blind to murder and mass killings in our name, and we are destroying the resources of the planet in the process. And it's a pity. It's a pity because a lot of us, if not all of us, belong to belief systems, traditions, and ideologies that ask us to question, to critique, you could be a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a communist, a secular democrat. The original purpose of every single one of your ideas was to break existing ways of seeing and to give you a revolutionary set of eyes with which to see the world. I was born a Muslim. But I didn't read the Qur'an in its English translation for the first time until I was 20 years old. And it was only then that I realized 
how much the Quran itself exhorts its readers to reflect on their surroundings, to question and critique existing paradigms, the things we take for granted on a daily basis, vision, seeing things clearly, I realized, was central to the Islamic creed. But vision is also central to Hinduism, central to Christianity, to Buddhism, to Judaism, to secular humanism. Vision is central to every single belief system or philosophy that aims to tell human beings how to be in the world. Because if human beings cannot see clearly, we cannot function in a manner that is appropriate to the world around us. And then we not only end up, con end up contributing to a world that is bad, we contribute to a world that systematically gets worse. As Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place not because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it and do nothing. That means the world is a dangerous place because of you and me. Now, out of this realization uh, was born a thesis. And the thesis was that if more people could critically connect with their beliefs, then more people would see the world for how it really is. And if more people saw the world for how it really is, more people would act in a manner that would bring about change. Bringing about this state of affairs then became my mission, my purpose, my jihad. Now, jihad is another term that has been mangled by the media and extremists alike today. And this mangling has been bolstered by the refusal of the silent majority to stand up and contest it, making jihad a case study of sorts for what I'm talking about here. If you look at popular discourse, the picture that emerges of jihad is something to do with mindless, brutal violence and nothing less or more. Uh, holy war is the most popular term used to describe it, but holy war is a term that doesn't even exist in the Islamic vocabulary. In its truest conception, jihad is something that we can all relate to, Muslim or no. Because essentially, jihad means to strive and struggle, an internal struggle for the integrity of your own soul, a struggle for the integrity of your own self. As the French poet Arthur Rimbaud said, the battle for the soul is as brutal as the battles of men. But I would argue that it's far more brutal because the battle here is subtle. The Hindu philosopher Swami Chimayananda called it an internal guerrilla warfare because the enemy is never out in the open. He comes out and attacks, he runs and hides, and then he comes out and attacks again. Now, this is what the landscape of ideas, of worldviews, inside our own heads. This is what it looks like. And this is what we have to struggle with every day. This is jihad. So, to paraphrase Tariq Ramadan, if you have a goal in life, then you have a path to get to that goal. And by having a path, all you need to know is that there will be struggle. Overcoming that struggle is jihad. So, while jihad can be explained using war as a metaphor, that's really about as far as it goes. And what's more, you don't need to be a Muslim to have a jihad. So, how do I go about my jihad? I use whatever tools, skills, and mediums I have at my disposal. And right now, that means photography, writing, and the internet. 
Now, the internet is another place that casts upon us this illusion of unadulterated, uncensored information, of consequence-free freedom of expression. But perhaps once it was like that, but no longer. The internet itself is today controlled by a few large institutions which now own the vast majority of the online landscape that you and I occupy. And this ownership, this control, conditions the way we consume and produce content. The opinions we form, the way we react to the things we see, our very consciousness and the way we act as a result of it. The internet also mines us for commercial gain. So, while you and I might quite rightly think that we use the internet, today it's becoming very, very different. The internet is using us. But I use one of these very platforms as a, a way of spreading my message. I started using Instagram in September 2012. Uh, Instagram is a mobile-based photo sharing application that allows you to share photographs and captions in an easy to access, easy to digest manner. Now, a lot of us might think that a photograph cannot construct reality in the same way as a painting, which can depict anything that the painter's imagination and skill can conceive of. But this is what Susan Sontag calls the lie of photography. The lie of photography is that a photographer, a photograph is something that is, well, there's something that depicts reality as it is. But actually, a photographer has just as much power, just as much leeway to manipulate reality as any painter. And he does this by choosing what to include and what to exclude from the frame. And Instagram adds yet another dimension that I use as a tool to enhance my message, which is text. So I do what I do by using photographic composition and text to take a given space and reimagine it in my own terms and spread the message that I want. Essentially, what I try to do is to take this platform called Instagram and to try to subvert it with my own messaging. Uh, in a small way, I see what I do as what the philosopher Umberto Eco called semiological guerrilla warfare. According to him, reality is constructed via semiotics, signs and symbols. And the only way to challenge these signs and symbols, for example, the signs and symbols telling us what beauty looks like or what wealth looks like or what romantic love should look like is to challenge them with your own signs and symbols. As Nelson Mandela put it, the best way to overcome the oppressor is to mirror his tactics. And this is what I see a lot of effective social media based activism doing today. So Instagram is my battlefield. My weapons are my pictures and my captions and the landscape that I want to change, to shift and influence, the space that I want to reimagine is the landscape of ideas, of worldviews. <clears throat> but change doesn't happen easily, uh, especially when you're trying to change and influence minds. Uh, and especially when you're working on a platform like social media, which in the form of cat pictures and selfies, we will have a massive amount of noise that will try to drown out your message. So while Instagram will tell me how many likes I get, it's really not going to tell me if that like means that someone stopped and read and internalized my message, or if they simply clicked the heart button uh, as a courtesy when they were flipping through their newsfeed as they were commuting uh, on the 120 bus to work on a Monday morning. But for 
internal change to happen, in my opinion, there must first be a dissonance. Uh, a dissonance between the reality you look at and the reality you see. And then a dissonance between the reality you see and the reality you believe in and sense. Most of us, we feel this dissonance on a daily basis. But only a few of us choose to widen it, to explore it. <clears throat> My goal then is to simply provide stimuli that not just trigger, but also try to widen these dissonances. My goal is to simply jolt my audiences just a little bit of their beaten path in the hope that one day this jolt will contribute to leading them in, in a whole new direction. And as I do this, I test and expose my own ideas and beliefs. And whenever I am challenged, I hope to criticize myself. And in the process, I learn. This then is my service to myself to humanity and God. This is my struggle, my jihad. All of us lead an existence akin to the human beings in the movie, The Matrix. Or to provide a more classical example, the shackled people in Plato's cave. All of us are blinded by our inability to see the truth. Yet, in that blindness, all of us are absolutely convinced that we are clear-sighted. Yet, each of us have insights that the rest of us don't. And so, each of us can see a different glitch in the matrix. So, each of us can potentially work towards unshackling others, together to finally reveal the matrix, which is this nexus of illusion that has been built for us by these institutions for what it really is. All of our minds are like dark labyrinths. We never stop to question if what we believe is true. But occasionally, like in the case of Alice in Wonderland, life shows us white rabbits disappearing down enticing rabbit holes. Or like in the case of the Matrix, it extends to us a hand asking us to choose between a red pill and a blue pill. Choose the red pill. Dive into your rabbit hole. Choose the path of cognitive dissonance. Find your struggle. And watch out for the omens that will guide you because they are literally everywhere. I leave you with a quote from the Buddha who said that there are only two mistakes you can make on the path to the truth. Not getting started and not going all the way. Thank you.